Good evening, everybody. I'm Roy Firestone, and this is Up Close Classic. He won six NBA championships, five MVP awards, two Olympic gold medals, and countless other accolades. Considered by many the greatest athlete of the 20th century. He is, of course, Michael Jordan, the best player the NBA has ever seen. But in 1984, he was a soft-spoken college junior from North Carolina. The measure of success and greatness in basketball, University of North Carolina, is not the awards and trophies. It's having a sandwich named after you. Let me give you an example. There is the sandwich named after Sam Perkins. There is the Big McAdoo named after Bob McAdoo. Dean Smith has his Smithsonian. The Larry Miller filler. And yes, there is now the Jordan sandwich. Let's discuss why it was almost a tongue sandwich. You know the reason. A lot of people don't. You have a habit of sticking your tongue out a lot on the court, huh? Well, it's a habit that I picked up when <laughs> I was small, and uh, I got it from my father, and I just can't get rid of it. <laughs> Not a real big surprise. Michael Jordan, the unanimous first-team All-American for the second straight season, leading score in the ACC, a 19.6 average. He shot 55% from the field, 77% from the free-throw line. An outstanding story. Michael Jordan, as you'll learn in just a few moments, didn't make his high school basketball team one year and sprouted up from a, a height of six foot one, which obviously is not very tall for a basketball player, to six five in one year. Let's backtrack for a moment. You didn't make a high school basketball team. Now you're the nation's college, nation's best college player. Well, I didn't make my varsity, and that was a big thing in high school. And uh, I wasn't that good. I was at a height of six one, and I really didn't develop my abilities until after I grew. Michael, what were you eating that you can sprout up four inches like that? I don't know. It, whatever I was eating, it was good, man. It helped me out a bit. <laughs> they call you the rabbit. That's one of the nicknames you had growing up. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this guy. He worked so hard. One year he was running a 4640. From one year to the next, he, he knocked that down from a 4640 to a 4340. You worked very, very hard, and you've worked very hard in your basketball skills as well. It's been very important to you, right? I just think that I have the habits of working hard. I, I always been taught that to reach a goal that in life that you want, you have to work hard to get to it. And so far, I just you know have that in mind. You are the third of five children in your family. Uh, you come from a very very close family. Your brother Larry, though, who is only five foot seven inches, was your big hero. In fact, he was your main inspiration. Is that not right? Yeah, he did. Uh, Larry used to be a, a very talented basketball player. He still is. And whenever I was about his height. He used to wear me out in the backyard, and uh, I guess from that determination just to beat him, uh, I guess that uh, made me work hard. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's just an outstanding basketball player at his height. People uh, discuss all the times the academic as well as the athletic aspects of this game. You have to be a rare story because you weren't necessarily recruited by North Carolina, though they were interested in you. But you went to the campus yourself because you wanted to see for yourself what the school was about academically, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't, well, North Carolina wasn't recruiting me at this time. Uh, I had this uh, Project Uplift, which is an uh, organization where uh, I mean, high school students get the chance to go to colleges and just see how it's like. And mm -hmm. I got the chance to visit North Carolina, and I saw not just the, the bad side, but I saw the good side also. And I wasn't shielded away from the university, as a lot of schools do. Mm -hmm. So I got to see the whole university within itself without the coaches knowing. Once upon a time, you were an NC State fan. In <laughs> fact, you were not a big fan of North Carolina. You were a David Thompson fan, and you rooted against North Carolina State, all, uh, North Carolina, I should say, all the time. I was a very avid NC State fan. I really liked them very much. I was really a David Thompson fan with his style of play, and I just couldn't stand Carolina. I, I don't <laughs> know why. It was a, it's just something that I didn't like about Carolina. And you know, I, when I got the chance to visit both schools, then I saw the family life atmosphere in North Carolina that fitted me well. You wouldn't know it. This guy very nearly became an NCAA baseball player. In fact, I know that deep down, baseball might be your first love. Billy Martin is one of your inspirations and your biggest heroes. Now, people would say, Michael Jordan, he loves Billy Martin. How could that be? I just like his controversial attitude. He always aroused uh, the fans and still maintains a, a good record. How good a baseball player were you? I wasn't that good. <laughs> uh, now we hear differently. I was pretty good. Uh, I played baseball ever since I was uh, seven, and I continued to play up until my eleventh grade year. What position? I, I pitched and I played center field, hmm. first base. I was somewhat utility man, yeah. but uh, I just enjoyed playing. And I did get a couple 
of offers along with my basketball offers and I just gave it up once I got to college. I want to talk about his dedication, his love, and his belief in himself in terms of being on the court or wherever the athletic arena is. This is a quote from Dean Smith. He said, of you, he doesn't come out and say, I'm better than you, but somewhere something comes through that he feels he is better as a player. Is that fair, do you think? I don't know. Uh, I think it's fair coming from Coach Smith. Uh, <laughs> He's a, a coach that finds a lot of weaknesses in your in your game, and he wants you to improve on your weaknesses. And you know, he he will find a weakness until you graduate. And you know, coming from him, I think that's a fair statement. Coming up on Up Close Prime Time, Michael Jordan on trash talking with the fans. Welcome back to Up Close Classic. Michael Jordan is one of the world's most recognizable celebrities. He's mobbed by fans virtually everywhere he goes, forcing him to sometimes take drastic measures. You decided one day in St. Louis that you were going to visit a mall, kind of a lazy afternoon. <laughs> this is what Michael Jordan has to do when he wants to go visit a mall, to go a little shopping. You wear disguises, right? Like the other Michael. Yeah, I did to a certain extent. Not the way I have uh, yeah, mustaches and, and fake stuff on, but I had shades. I turned my head and my hat backwards and then wear high water shorts and pants and stuff and looked just kind of awkward. And, and you figured that would be enough. How long did that last? <laughs> About an hour and 15 minutes, not long. <laughs> they recognized you, that was the end of the... Michael Jordan! Yeah, a couple of my teammates were with me, but what gave it away, I was walking with Brad Sellers and he was, you know, seven feet and everybody she's seven foot guy, they're gonna say, well, he plays basketball. And then they kind of stare at me and that gives it away. Well, people always ask it, I'll ask it again. Do you feel you're a prisoner of your own fame? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. I kind of brought this on myself, but... Uh, there's some advantages and disadvantages for, for being in my shoes, but uh, you know, when you want to go to a mall and when, when you want to enjoy yourself and, and hang out with the guys, it makes it tough, but you have to put up with it, and, and sometimes you want it. I mean, initially, when I first got into the league, it was fun. You have to admit, uh, to sign autographs and be recognized and, and people uh, know who you are, it's fun, but after a while, it does get old, and, and now this is something that I have to deal with it. Uh, because I enjoyed it from the beginning, but I have to deal with it now. Mm. Let's we'll talk about your game for a little bit, and then we're going to talk about other things in your life. Your game is changing a lot. Not as dazzling on a certain level, but on another level it's even more dazzling, because there's not as many slam dunks. We saw the other night a game that you played where you didn't, you, I think you had one slam dunk. They want you to take the shot now outside, and you did against Sacramento. Well, I'm, I'm taking what the defense has given me. I think the scouting report, if I'm not mistaken, about Michael Jordan is that they make him shoot the outside shot. And once he sh shoots the outside shot, if he can't hit it, then you know, that's his weakness. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm starting to take my outside shot a lot more because it sets up everything for me. You know, mm -hmm. if I shoot the outside shot, then that means the defense has got to come out and play on, play me. And that allows me to go past him and get those spectacular dunks that the fans want to see. I was going to ask you about these spectacular dunks, and there's a lay-in that's even more spectacular <laughs> on some level. Do you feel that you have to outdo yourself nightly? I mean, uh, do you feel as though, look at that. I mean, when are you going to say, I don't think I can beat that. I don't think I could possibly eclipse what I just, sh just showed to the folks. Uh, when I retire, I think that <laughs> uh, you always feel that you can improve. And uh, <laughs> look at that I, reaction. I, I, I love never that. stop. You know, I'm, I'm always saying that I want to improve, and you know, it's, it's tough some some nights when you're playing away from home because you know that fans want to see their team win, and see you score 50. That's just the way they want to see it. And but you want to do whatever you can to help the team win. And sometimes you please both uh, by scoring 50 and yet disappointing them too by winning. You were the first player in NBA history to get uh, 200 steals and 100 blocks in the same season. Then you did it again. I think that that may be the crowning jewel for you. A aside from all the scoring championships, the fact that you are considered now the greatest defensive player in the game. I like to be known for my uh, defense. I think that's something that's overlooked. I think offensively, when I average or score 50 to 50 some points, that can be seen. That's what most people see is, mm -hmm. is the scoring part, but they they don't see the defensive part of the game. So. I enjoy getting the recognition on the defensive end because it complements my offensive skills. Mm -hmm. Are you able to make the transition, though, from offense to defense as easily as you'd like? They say if there's one part of the game that, that perhaps you'd like to improve on, that would be it. Yeah, I, I would think that uh, being that I'm not called upon to do so much on the offensive end, I think that allows me more energy to, to uh, be a Michael Cooper or Alvin Robinson who can deny the ball and play him straight up. 
defense. Uh, a lot of my defense comes from the gambling, where the teams, uh, where I'm allowed to leave my man and help out on the big guy and sneak up from behind and get the block shot or the steal. And a lot of people say that's gambling, but gambling is a part of defense. My favorite moment, I think, all, in all of last year was when you, you slammed a dunk and a big monster dunk over John Stockton of the Jazz. And one of the <laughs> fans yelled out, you know what I'm going to say, one of the fans yelled out, hey, pick on somebody your own size. And the next opportunity you had, you slammed a jam over Mel Turpin, who's about 6'10". I remember and that. you yelled back at the fan. What did you yell at him? Is he big enough? Is he big enough? <laughs> you like to talk to the fans on the court. I do. I think the fans should be involved in it. Uh, they they're here to see the game, they're here to see the entertainment, and if you don't talk back to them, then it seems like you're isolated from them, and I like talking back to them. I think Magic does it, and uh, I think it's a part of the game. I think it shows that you enjoy the game so much that you don't feel that the game is such a business that you don't want to talk to people and show that you love the game. Mm. We want to talk about the dunk, but before we get into the people who shaped you and inspired you to dunk, I want to talk about where the dunk comes from, where your game comes from. Rural North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina. We have some video of the beauty that is North Carolina and those lazy summer <laughs> afternoons playing on the, on the blacktop. Let's, let's reminisce a little bit. There, of course, is the campus. And what North Carolina gave you in your life that maybe you couldn't have gotten a big city? Well, I think uh, from a big city, um it kept me out of a lot of trouble. I think uh, you go into a big city, you got the more uh, chances to be in the trouble. Um, plus, being in North Carolina, I think uh, it put me in a, in a residential background that your parents could have a bigger influence on you, I think. Um, and plus, I think it helps me keep my, my mind to, to earth. You know, being in a big city, you kind of get caught up in the, in the, in the glamour a little bit. And uh, I being from North Carolina, you kind of keep your feet on the ground. But Childhood friend of James Worthy, by the way, too. Yeah. Right? Play a lot of one-on-one -on, -one on the courts. We did in college a lot. But uh, I think that the University of North Carolina really gave me uh, all the different fundamentals that I've learned about basketball and uh, little things about life. I think mm. they really taught me a lot about it. Nine years ago, I think it was only nine years ago, Wilmington, one night, Williston High School against D.C. Virgo. You remember the night? You were five foot nine inches, a ninth grader, and you were a junior high school dunking for the first time. Didn't lot, know I did it. Not a lot of junior high school kids can dunk, especially at five. <laughs> but foot. everybody tries now. <laughs> I bet everybody now. Everybody tries. <laughs> you remember the night when, when the fans went, ooh, and ah, and it really kind of powered you. It was almost like a, like a natural athletic high. Right. Um, I was, I remember I, I've gotten a steal. Um, I was on the break, and I've been trying in practice, and, for so many times and I never seemed to do it. And I guess the intensity of the fans and of the game, I went up to lay it in, not to dunk it, but to lay it in. And I felt that I was high enough to dunk the ball. And I kind of just flipped it over and dunked it. And it was a baby dunk, but it was a dunk. You didn't, you didn't do one of those parallel to the basket things or anything no, like that? No, no, okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> Remember watching TV when you were a kid and seeing Dr. J and saying, I want to be like this guy. I've seen Dr. J. I mean, he was an epitome of a lot of kids. I mean, when you, when you thought of the NBA, you thought of Dr. J. Uh, that's how much he meant to the game. He carried that label for that long, and everyone wanted to see him dunk the ball. Uh, so I think his dunks really inspired a lot of people besides myself. Yeah. We're going to take a look at uh, Julius in action. There he is. Whoa! What do you call this one right there? I don't know. I, I, I think Dr. J is like myself. We, we never really name our dunks. We let the fans do that. I think they enjoy doing that. Uh, we enjoy doing them, and I think they enjoy naming them. Do you feel that you carry on Julius's legacy to this game? I think I have a part of it. I think uh, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Isaiah Thomas, I think all these people, along with myself, carry that label of the NBA. I think uh, Julius and I are very similar in terms of what we try to do with the kids and, and what positive role models that we try to be. Uh, but I don't think anyone can carry the legacy like he carried it. Mm. You're talking this before about uh, the kids and how important it is to be a role model for whether you want to or not. It is, right. it is the case in your life. And you've got 5,000 square feet living out of Chicago, <laughs> beautiful new home. You've got a Porsche, you've got a black vet, multi-millions of dollars. But still, when you get one-on-one -on -one with a child, and you are moved by a child for whatever reason, in this case, it would be the Make-A-Wish Foundation. 
all the money in the world doesn't mean that much. It's just you and that child, right? You're right. I mean, you feel how fortunate you are um, that you obtained something like this, and that is the picture. I remember uh, it was I was playing him one on one in a wheelchair, and I thought it would be easy, and it wasn't. That little kid just wore me out, <laughs> and it made me praise him a lot for having the determination to to keep all, hold of those dreams of playing basketball, and um, and I had to feel. Uh, I had to feel a lot for him because, it, you know, he really felt that he could beat me. And in those dreams, he wanted to play me, and he beat me in fair and square in his game. And mm -hmm. uh, you have to think about that for a minute. And you can't – I don't feel above those people when I, when I do that, those things. Uh, it really brings me down to earth when I do those things. Mm -hmm. For all of the things that you have going for you in life, and it is considerable, I mean, you are the Michael Jackson of professional <laughs> sports, of all of sports, truly, that you don't ever lose sight of the fact that, my God, I love playing this game. I, I love the fact that I can virtually have anything I want, but I never forget who I am. You are anchored to that belief. And that comes from my parents, I think. Uh, you know, it's, it's great. I love the game of basketball, and I feel that, that if I didn't get paid right now, i still play the game of basketball, without a doubt. And I don't want to ever lose that love. If I do, then I want to quit. I know this is a business. I know a lot of people make a lot of money in, in the game of basketball. But no one can uh, express or pay the love that I have for the game uh, because I've done it for so many years. and. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just brought me some riches and it's brought me some, uh, some different things. Uh, but I still owe basketball a lot and I still love the game. When we come back, the early conflicts between Jordan and the other NBA superstars. I skipped a lot of steps uh, coming into the league. I didn't work my way up to the top. I skipped a lot of steps and hmm. sometimes that creates some jealousies. Welcome back. When Michael Jordan entered the NBA in 1984, it was the League of Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. While it seems hard to imagine today, back then Michael was often cast in the role of the outsider. Let's talk about your peers. We have the, the cover of the Street and Smith annual basketball issue, and there it is, Larry and Michael and Magic. When you're on the court with either of those guys, do you ever say, wow, I wish I could do that, or I, I, I wish I would have done it that way? Yeah. I'm amazed by certain things that they do, and, and sometimes it is a sense of uh, trying to Im intimidate, uh, imi imitate one of the players. Or intimidate, too, whatever <laughs> the case might be, right? But uh, I love playing with those guys uh, because you know they're going to be very competitive. They got hearts just like you. Uh, they want to want the ball when the time's, uh, when the time's running out. Um, and they're, they're one of the greatest players in the, in the league, and it's, sometimes it's great to play against players like that, and a lot of people compare us. And it, a lot of people put one above the other, which I don't think is fair to all either one of us. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's fun. I love being around them. It wasn't always fun, though, admittedly, with uh, you and Magic and Isaiah. I'm talking about 1985. A lot of basketball fans are aware there was what they call the freeze out. For some reason, Isaiah and Magic didn't necessarily like it, what you were doing on the court. And they decided to have their own little freeze of Michael Jordan, not to literally not let them uh, be affected by you or for you to be a factor in the game. You were able to smooth it over over the years, but initially it was difficult to get acceptance. It was tough uh, because I, I was very confused. I didn't understand exactly what was going on. I didn't understand the reasoning. Uh, I felt that, uh, you know, I always felt that I was the lowest on the totem pole and had to work my way up, so I didn't go in cocky. I made sure that I wasn't going to do that. But I, I finally figured out as I got older that natural jealousy is a part of professional uh, sports in any job. Mm -hmm. And I felt um, I skipped a lot of steps uh, coming into the league. I didn't work my way up to the top. I skipped a lot of steps. And <laughs> sometimes that creates some jealousies and, and uh, just natural jealousies. But right now, I, I think we both and all three of us, uh, we realize and we respect all of us, all, all three of us. and. Uh, We've gotten over that period. I think that was more or less the initial uh, part of it. And 
um, I still respect both of them, and, and I spent a lot of time with uh, Magic in his game. And, mm -hmm. and What'd you score, by the way, in the Magic All Star game this past year? 52, 50 50, something? 55. Something like that. I just wanted to <laughs> find out if you were playing. But I enjoyed it. I mean, yeah, I saw him, I uh, spent some time with him at the fight, uh, yeah. the Tyson fight, and, and then I came back in uh, the latter part of the summer for a vacation of seven days, and uh -huh. I called him up and see what he was doing, and we met at a club, and That's nice. we hung out. But uh, I think we're all over that period. Uh, it's something that you know, initially happened, and I don't have any uh, any regrets or any uh, any problems with them right mm -hmm. now. You mentioned the Tyson fight. I wasn't going to bring this up, but I will anyway, I guess. There was a rumor <laughs> that Robin Givens sent her resume to ProServe, your management firm, <laughs> seeking to date Michael Jordan. Is that true? It wasn't really her resume. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what was it then? I was back in school. Uh, I was working on my degree, and uh, yeah, I think she was coming up for a new show, which was uh, head of the class, and she had a premiere party for that. And um, her publicist asked who she would love to escort her to the to the party, and she threw out her, my name, not thinking that a oh. publicist would. Uh, tracked me down to see if I wanted to go, and he did. He sent her bio to ProServe, and ProServe sent it to me, and I was in my final exams, and I couldn't go, and I called up and said that I wouldn't be able to make it, and hopefully mm. sometime I get a chance to meet her. Mm. All things being equal, maybe this is unfair, but are you glad that maybe one thing didn't lead to another and that maybe she was Mrs. Well, Jordan? <laughs> no, at the time I was in a relationship, so... Oh, I see. Uh, I, I was, see how you I was covered. <laughs> We do this periodically for special people, and that is I'll throw a word at you. It doesn't have to be a one-word response. Maybe it can be a, a few sentences, but these are important words in life, and maybe you give us some insights as what they mean to you. What's triumph mean? What do you associate with triumph? Winning. All the time. Winning. How about joy? The game. I love the game. Fear. What's your big fear? Snakes. <laughs> Snakes? <laughs> Just any kind of snake? Any kind of snake. Doesn't have to be poisonous. No. Mm -hmm. But freedom on and off the court. The game. I love the game. It frees me from a lot of things. <laughs> Art. Feel you're an artist out there? Yeah, I think so. I think I'm an artist, especially when I create and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> love? My parents. Passion. The game. <laughs> Reverts back there. Yeah. Finally, the moment. When is the moment? When does it become the moment? We on top. Michael Jordan retired at the top of his game after the 1998 NBA season. In that last season, he dominated the league, leading the Bulls to a sixth championship and winning the MVP for both the regular season and the playoffs. His name is synonymous with greatness. He's the standard by which all future NBA superstars will be judged. I'm Roy Firestone. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Up Close Classic.